Hello everyone, today we talk about Roger de Flore and the Catalan Grand Company between 1302-1311. Um, so this is an important chapter we never actually discussed and therefore today we present just an introduction to. Uh, we'll surely expand on it. We made a video on Roger de Flore back in the day, I think two years ago, uh, looking at the uh, rise to power to command, I mean, at least the means through which he achieved that, especially uh, in Italy, and consequently giving a context to this um, very dynamic uh, maritime uh, environment uh, characterized by piracy, trade, um, you know, war in fact, and the title sounded something like that. In that is typical of medieval warfare when, you know, the difference between the the military and civilian environment objectively was quite loose. We see it dramatically well. In naval warfare, we discuss, for example, Venetian and Genoese warfare in the Levante during more or less the same period. Um, this context is to be deepened further because um, looking at the Catalan mercenaries, especially, which is the topic of today's video, we find them already you know, present here and there before the uh, great adventure of the uh, of the grand company proper right and this reflects broadly speaking a phenomenon that is the one of the 13th century rise of barcelona in catalonia uh, in in the mediterranean broadly meant this would open as you know to the expansion first in sicily that to which the in fact the, the birth of the grand company is is closely tied to eventually in in the first half of the 14th century, the conquest of Sardinia, and the expansion, in fact, through the same uh, grand company, as we'll see today, in, in Greece, in Turkey, um, especially of, of the Aragonese crown, that intervened here and there, but this was fundamentally an autonomous, uh, de facto independent uh, company, right, but that had ties back home. We will make other videos uh, about both the, this, the the Aragonese expansion in Mediterranean, because it's it's somewhat complex and non-linear, and when we look at realities like Aragon, um, but even within the Kingdom of Aragon, of Aragon and Catalonia, for example, there were deeper differences, and they would remain uh, historically. But, uh, for example, with the Kingdom of Sardinia and the Vice Kingdom of Sicily, we see actually a autonomous realities that also behaved a little bit on their own. Sometimes they even were conflictual, one another, aligned themselves with the Angevins. Yes, it did happen even that, even if you know the, the bitter struggle of, of the Sicilian Vespers between the two halves of what was fundamentally Kingdom of Sicily at that point. Um, and therefore you can imagine already in here, and this is even more evident in, in the Eastern Mediterranean with the decline of you know of the Byzantine Empire at least that had already occurred, right? At this point the Palaiologi have already re-seized Constantinople, but, you know, the empire is nothing like it was before, um, the, the, the greater fragmentation even of, um, of, of Anatolia in a sense, but, you know, yes, Greece didn't keep either objectively, uh, of a fundamental instability, right, from a political point of view, that naturally favored the rise of such, uh, of such mercenary companies. Uh, this is very important for a number of reasons. First of all, because there are uh, comparable dynamics happening elsewhere, especially during the 14th century. Um, as you know, look at France, look at Italy. Um, and generally speaking, this capacity of projection that seems sometimes really astonishing. But the Grand Catalan Company is peculiar because it emerges probably most fragile of these realities, um, and where the most instability, in fact, is to be found. And also, it achieves a, a striking uh, a series of victories, especially against the Turks, uh, that uh, are beaten repeatedly, and this is also fascinating. At some point, we should study in detail the, the campaign proper. The sources are, let's say, so-so in, in terms of of reliability. Sometimes I had the opportunity to work a bit with the Montaner Chronicle that was written, in fact, by the same secretary of Roger de Flore, uh, and that, however, is not like 
uh, it's actually a very good chronicle. It's spot on. It's precise. It does tell important things, but it's also kind of, you know, adjusts maybe a bit the stories in their own way. I noticed this, if anything, because I compared that that specific chronicle, and also considering this was actually the base for further chronicles that were used even by the, the official sources of the kings of Aragon later on, like um, the the chronicle of Peter the Ceremonies and so on. So um, there is a bit of um, not necessarily of apology, but of course these are the heroes of the situation, right? Um, which doesn't erase the fact, you know, the, the the evidence of violences, as we'll see, and negative aspects. But are not in terms of strate- I'm talking about specific strategical and tactical reconstruction, right? All that probably reliable. But this is not very important, if not for the fact that when you study these battles, you always see numbers to go a bit, and especially from the Turkish side in, in in the range of, but even Byzantine side sometimes of tens of thousands of horsemen, right? As if they were, you know, that there is. Probably, of course, we have to, as we'll see now, point out that these were mostly light troops, right? And that that world surely was. Think about the Gazis, for example, from the Islamic side, but even all the the amount of soldier mercenaries that the Byzantines could levy at that point um, from everywhere. It, that yes, that does confer, but you know, to these great um, ra- raiding parties, we could say this participative character for which they, they would increase the numbers just to loot and so on. But this naturally speaks of a very different context from, you know, for example, Western European battlefields, where, in fact, um, such mercenaries uh, do not actually achieve a great deal. And I personally deepened, now, maybe one day we'll talk about this, um, but, you know, the, 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 the Catalan infantry was naturally coming even in there from a specific context of the Reconquista we'll talk about in a while. Um, that was different from ours. Um, the cattle and the Aragonese nobility had heavy cavalry, were heavily francicized uh, in warfare. I mean, th- there is um, a divide that would be interesting to, to study in terms of political and social background to who were. Um, the Almogavars that we'll see in a while, and um, what was the broader, you know, effectiveness elsewhere from these contexts in here? Because at a certain point, for example, the wealth cities in Italy that were under the Angevin hegemony at the point get completely rid of these troops that were used by the Angevin vicaries to, you know, as as garrisons, right? And they do not achieve much there. Where exactly while the, the Italians were hiring en masse. Uh, German and French heavy cavalry on a regular base. Naturally, that tells you also by scale of money invested that, um, and also of number of men that there was a specific political need and a strategic need for having s- such military assets. Uh, but it, it's meaningful, uh, however, how you know the difference between that reality and, for example, the one you see in, in Turkey, in in uh, in Greece which is completely different, where you find the the Catalans basically winning every time. Um, and prob- probably in ways that were related to the heavier character of their warfare compared to to Eastern standards that in- instead were actually, you know, a character was actually much lighter, in fact, for, for Western standards. So that is extremely important for understanding and dimensioning better the uh, European warfare of the time, Consider the Catalans would win the striking victory also over the Athenian read French um, uh, knights at the Battle of Cephisus in 1311. That is probably the, the, among all the, vic- the, the early 14th century infantry victories in Europe, it's the most complete from a strictly tactical point of view. Right? What, what, it was, achieved, what it was achieved there um, is amazing. We will make a video on that battle. And even there, I presume we should understand perhaps a bit more the character of the the Athenian army that wasn't just about heavy cavalry, but also, uh, you know, lighter for the auxiliary types that you could find in Greece that were somewhat different from the ones they could find, I don't know, in France, in Italy, and so on. Um, This is the context in, let's say, in in a broader 
uh, look. Looking at a bit of the prehistory of the Catalan mercenaries, as we were say, uh, saying before, you know that the, the Catalan Grand Company would be hired by the Byzantines, as we will see. So, the presence of Catalans in the Mediterranean, that at this point was lar basically dominated by the Italians, but Aragon enters, right, and especially in opposition to Genoa, right, in the western Mediterranean, while well, Venice was, you know, less actually backing the Aragonese against the Genoese for that reason, because the two were always quarreling in, in the, you know, they were actually fighting open, massive, if you look at the resources invested in naval warfare in those, they're probably the largest in Europe at the time, uh, in that scenario, um, and, uh, I mean, easily, I mean, the, the maritime ones, there's no doubt, but I mean, even in just in, in warfare, to core, right? Even terrestrial warfare all over Europe, probably those were the, the greatest capitals spent, because the Venetians naturally were, uh, and Genoese were battling over the, the control on the eastern routes. Um, and um, so Aragon would rise as a power mostly eroding Genoese power. That in fact also would create other interesting dynamics, because the Genoese say, okay, screw, it, screw this, and they, they basically opened the Atlantic route to reach England, Flanders. Um, from from the west, uh, I mean, from 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 that route that was not um, open, let's say, you know, with those levels of traffic, and that would trigger other very important um, dynamics. But um, this permeability of markets, uh, also the one of war, um, starts witnessing the rise of the Catalans. That would remain, in fact, even up to the Renaissance, together with the Italians, with the major. In fact, maritime, uh, even operators, cartographers, I mean, all the people were all about the sea um, and uh, their technicality and so on. So we find Catalan mercenaries first recorded in Byzantine service in 1279, so good 20 years before the events of the Grand Company. Um, and also the battle, uh, the, the campaign leading up to the Battle of uh, Negroponte we find Corsairs of Catalan origin appearing on occasion in the fleets of the pirate Megas um, Dux uh, Licario, who was, um, in fact, commander Byzantine fleet um, of Italian origin, and John de Locao, who was a Genoese pirate. Um, so even here you see, basically, what had been in the Byzantine world up to that, it would remain, like, all basically, the, the, the navy was all Italian. But it was not until, in fact, 1302 that, however, Byzantines start employing Catalans as land forces, in particular large numbers. Particularly large numbers. Uh, we will see better why. Because mm, the background we gave before is starting from the War of the Sicilian Vespers of 1282. You know what happened in there. Basically, Charles of Anjou, king of Sicily, was to launch um, an invasion of the Byzantine Empire, and it would have been wiped out. I mean, the Angevins would have been able to conquer, reconquer Constantinople, and to, you know, at that point, French power would have been challenged everywhere, right? So, uh, the Byzantines and the Aragonese that uh, were enemies of, of, of the French at that point, Aragon would be invaded by, you know, had been invaded by the father of Philip IV, you know, there was definitely a ghibelline character of Aragonese policy, um, made Sicily rise uh, against the, the Angevins, so much in fact that Peter of Aragon landed in Trapani and uh, seized control of Sicily. And this war that w went on for 20 years, right, engulfed basically the whole southern Italy because uh, now, the Kingdom of Sicily was split in two. Both sides claimed, actually, the title of uh, Sicilian king for themselves so much. In fact, even the Neapolitan kingdom that remained under the Angevins, and however was the strongest one, um, was technically called Kingdom of Sicily. Um, because they, they all wished, naturally, to reunite the thing. Actually, the Aragonese would make it in the end, in the mid-15th century, but, you know, very different context. At this point, Sicily was definitely the weaker uh, side. But never, nevertheless, the Angevins spent themselves enormously to launch this massive invasions of Sicily, actually leading to, to nowhere, right? And and this prolonged state of warfare naturally made collapse the um you know, the unity the the of the of the Sicilian kingdom, its 
you know, that have been up to that point and a very, you know, important um, reality uh, in uh, in terms of you know statal control and capac- structural capacity. Instead, from there, there is a major crisis that invests both areas, um, and there is in fact the privatization, as it always happens, also of local affairs of local business. Um, this is where Roger de Flor um, rose from, because um, you have to imagine here, I don't know, in, in all the southern Italian coasts, a lot of magnates, the various barons of, of the kingdom, and now take matters in their own hands. Um, the, the centers of power were somewhat detached from the periphery, and so it was all about business in terms of maritime traffics, including piracy, uh, assaulting each other in, in the broader theater of the war, but in an enormously complicated political scenario, uh, where all the, the, the Italian maritime republics intervened, the two sides here b- launched these massive expeditions, they needed to subcontract you know, the supplies, logistics, um, and in all of this, this, this various lords and rising captains would, would, would be in continuous military uh, commitment and uh, fuel piracy and this went far abroad also with the, with the broader Mediterranean traffics and so on. So an extremely dynamic reality because the areas were rich and uh, yet they were all troubled and that would offer in fa- for, for this very reason um, an enormous uh, attraction uh, for, for whoever wanted to, to make fortune also there as a, as a mercenary uh, etc. Um, by uh, thir- uh, 1302, the war was finally ended, would be resumed uh, regularly, but this was the major, you know, m- you know, tract of it, uh, with the peace of Caltabellotta, where Frederick uh, III of, Ar- of Aragon, king of Sicily, too, um, could finally dispense with the service of those mercenaries that had risen, uh, during the war, that had become threatening to the same, uh, to the same Aragonese power that was in fact that were in fact formed as the Grand Company of the Catalans under Roger de Flor. Right. This is normal in many contexts. At this point, there is no thing like permanent armies. There is definitely no money to to pay these guys, even on you know on a uh, ad hoc basis. Um, so. The first thing they, they would do when they, they the war is over and they can't raid and pillage and whatever is to probably turn against the their, their own employers. So you have to get r- uh, rid of them as quickly as you can. And actually, this grand company was pretty powerful, right? It wasn't just, you know, other powers had much better control on their mercenaries. You're talking about a force of already 18,000 strong, right? And also a very well organized one in logistical terms in aids, um, um, supply systems, uh, so um, these were really dangerous and however could project themselves strategically uh, in, in other theaters as we'll see now. Um, most of this force was made up of Iberians, they were Catalans mostly, um, they, uh, they had come with, uh, with, the, with the king back in, in the day um, and they were this mm, kind of heterogeneous mm, ensemble of, of troopers, m- most stereotypically, you know, at, at least at the majority of these numbers, even with an 18,000 uh, 18, strong army in the, in the late, uh, in the early 14th century can mean, is naturally is, there's an, a substantial amount of infantry there, as we will see. Um, but besides the Catalans, uh, it included Italians, Frenchmen, Germans, and some Aragonese, which tells you that, you know, there was ju- just next door to Catalonia, but they wouldn't participate in, in the same way. Um, and when actually this army had been firstly raised by Peter of Aragon in 1281 for invading Sicily, uh, it had mm, included also Berbers, no Andalusians, so it was a very mixed force. Mm-hmm. And you know that... Um, Especially the the, the 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 southern shores of I mean the African shores of the Mediterranean are fundamentally about this kind of lighter warfare that can be seen also in in Andalusia in in certain parts of the also the Iberian Peninsula because of, if anything the the very tough terrain that doesn't quite uh, allow uh, 
um, in the, that favors guerrilla hit and run tactics. And, and, and Spain had also this kind of autonomous communities that weren't just framed within the, however, ever growing feudal rule. It was a very diverse uh, reality, as we discussed many times. So, uh, Roger de Flor, as it's called, I presume in, in the same Catalan sources and in a, also in a bit French sounding way sometimes. Um, but the the real name of whom was actually Rutger von Blum, or Ruggero da Fiore, considering that he was basically uh, a German Italian. Uh, his father was a f uh, falconer uh, at the service of the of the Hohenstaufen in in southern Italy. He died at uh, at the battle. Of, uh, uh, as a consequence of the Battle of Taliacozzi in 1268 with the army of Conrad in Oswabia. Uh, his mother was uh, instead a Napoleon noblewoman. And uh, Roger Rose, in, in that aforementioned context of piracy and, and, and business, um, in very, you know, um, rocambolesque ways, we, we could say, um, Roger is considered a bit by the father of the condottieri, in a sense, because despite this is, you know, of course, doesn't mean uh, anything categorical, but um, indeed the, the business dimension of this we made we highlight in, in the aforementioned video is it's definitely on the fore as a and a dynamic. He was actually an apostatized Templar sergeant who had made his first uh, fortune and fame at the fall of Acre in 1291. Right when he had uh, commandeered uh, a Templar galley and charged exorbitant prices for uh, shipping uh, these uh, survivors to to Cyprus, that tells a bit the guy. In fact, he eventually rose uh, as a commander. He went back to Italy. He rose as a commander. He he was excommunicated, right, for his uh, deeds in that sense, and also because of his double playing against the, the, the Papal Angevin bloc and so on. Um, so he mm, spent considerable time as a captain, uh, as a pirate captain of a Genoese ship, because the Genoese were the most involved in the, in the wars of the Sicilian um, Vespert naval forces wise. Um, and Roger joined eventually the mercenary troops of Frederick uh, the third in, in Sicily, becoming thus commander of the Catalan Grand Company. Um, and uh, he um, made his fortune at that point, abandoning Italy and going to serve, to sell his services to the Byzantine Emperor Andronicus II against the Turks in exchange for several privileges. Right, so here the, the Aragonese Byzantine connection continues because naturally uh, the Angevins, in the sense, allied with the Turks. I mean, that was more or less the, the, it was way more fragmented than like that in terms of political sides, but it, it functioned like that. As we've seen, the Byzantines were, you know, they would have been the next Angevin target, and the Aragonese had, you know, blocked uh, the, the invasion. Um, Roger acquired an enormous prestige at court. He was um, appointed as Megas Dux, that was basically the commander of the imperial forces. Um, uh, eventually he got the title of Caesar. He married uh, Andronicus' niece, who was also the daughter of the Bulgarian Tsar. So he entered the imperial family, in a sense. And that's how powerful he had become. The Byzantines were trying to save their... Anatolian possessions were constantly threatened by the Ottoman Turks already, um, that were uh, basically taking uh, out one by one all the Byzantine Ammon posts, um, especially in, in the western part of Anatolia, the, the Aegean one that was considerably, you know, considering the coastal plains of the the the, the mouths of, of the rivers coming from the interland, were important areas that had maintained already some kind of, you know dynamic towns after all uh, the, um, the this uh, but it was there were frontier areas right this since the time of Manzikert had uh, you know before there were Florida areas so this become frontier it had become somewhat militarized so this had contracted economical activities urbanization there was a broader decline but still they were very important especially for the Turks to acquire this uh, control of this access to the sea 
uh, that instead the Byzantines had always uh, retained. Um, so Byzantine sources record the strength of the Catalan company when it sailed from Sicily to Constantinople as between two to, to, to eight thousand men. Montaner, that is, uh, as we've seen, the floor's secretary, um, is more reliable for this reason and records uh, them at 36 uh, ships and 6,500 men, which is normally the, in fact, number given by, followed by the rest of historiography, comprising 1,500 cavalry and 14,000 uh, almogavares, right? The, the there are these Aragonese mountaineers uh, from uh, Almugavar that as we've seen I remember we already said it, it's, uh, it means raiders in 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 Arab, and were typical mm, uh, troopers of the of the Iberian Peninsula and especially, I mean, but I think all together, but they're mostly famous because of the the Catalan the Aragonese background, let's say, um, especially as mountaineers in fact, and they. Uh, they were specialized in this light tactics, right? It's a bit difficult to characterize them precisely. We will make videos specifically uh, specifically dedicated to the Almogavars. Um, but let's say that when we observe these armies, we don't have to think of them as just, you know, light troopers, right? Th these were you know, a, a light, lighter armies than the average, but of course they would always include uh, knights, heavy cavalry. There were lots of noblemen within them as well that would f fight in the in full western panoply. Um, of course, lighter troopers, crossbowmen, lancers, javeliners, even slingers. Um, so, the, we should point out that this would have been normal, actually, for, for a western army. Of course, these were a bit more ethnical in nature. For example, I don't know, javeliners and slingers, it's, you don't find many of them. In, in, in Western Europe, except in, in Spain or maybe in the Celtic fringe. Um, but the idea of this rabble, you know, of desperates that follows many, you know, armies for sake of loot, etc., and also participates as light troopers in the army, it's present all over. Um, and in my opinion, there is not a specific tactics that distinguishes them properly as an army from, from others. Right, as we were saying before, they were lighter for Western standards, but heavier for Eastern standards, and this explains a lot. The proportion of cavalry is also meaningful, right? Uh, this is not uh, pr just a light arm, right? Even even if this 1500 cavalry has lighter elements than the average, it's still an important force, and it should be considered uh, properly such. Here, to it um, Montaner says other. 1,000 infantry, by the way, because 1,500 plus uh, 14, uh, 4,000 4, doesn't make 6,500. This the, the remaining uh, infantry would have been very mixed, even in their very multi-ethnic problem. We have seen before there were lots of Italians, Frenchmen, Germans, etc. So those were people coming from uh, a fully, you know, Western, we'll say Frankish, era of warfare basically um, and they wouldn't differ that much because if you look even at the iconographic evidence um, there might have been in fact lighter or heavier troopers but they, they their gear was very similar in, in many ways anyhow um, um, this sum also does not include the seamen who um, probably um, may be the difference between the for example, Montaner's 6,500 men and the author's Pachimera's 8,000. Uh, the latter, however, uh, records the size of the Flores fleet as only 18 galleys and four, quote, great ships, since Genoa supplied a number of his ships. Um, uh, this may mean that um, the author indicates just the ones that were uh, Roger's own. In any case, the, the important thing is that by the spring 1303, the Catalans numbered around 6,000 men, mm -hmm. which is not a few. It's a real army, right? It's, uh, as we've seen, it's probably also very well articulated, um, organically speaking, it's well supplied. Um, and at, the, at his arrival in, at Constantinople, the floor, as we've seen, w was appointed immediately uh, Megas Dux, um, this was a term of properly of, of the hiring contract, 
right? Um, and there was some trouble in the capital, though, because the Genoese um, rebelled against uh, this appointment as they feared uh, cattle interference in their markets. Um, so there, w there were scuffles in which thousands of them were killed by the Catalans that, however, you know, um, co having caused also this, this trouble, generally speaking, in the city, were you know, promptly shipped over to Asia Minor to, to get them, to get rid of them. Because the, this is exactly the point. You need these troops to, to go fight you, you appoint them, you give them privileges and so on individually to their leaders, but then you, you send them away. These guys have to leave us something. They can't burden your uh, your, your, your trunks, uh, your, they, they, you know, they, they can't make the, this violence around, um, and, you know, that the Byzantines, generally speaking, were rightfully distrustful of, of, of foreigners, and that's how Roger de Flor began his campaign against the Turks, and there is this astonishing series of victories that we can't list, uh, individually, but it's a very complex, we are also very well informed about the, the the, the broader movements, thanks to Montaner, the, the most famous engagements are the ones in Tsitsikos, Philadelphia, and the and the Cilician Gates. Um, so that tells you also how far into Anatolia they, the the Catalans pushed, because they literally began to defeat time after time this this Turkish armies, chiefly. Uh, you, I mean, if you s make a sum of all the the dead according to <laughs> the chronicler. Um, uh, you know, you have up to 50,000 kills, right, something in, in several engagements subtractively, but you have these large numbers um, that can be probably criticized, but nevertheless, the the story, uh, how the story is told, it shows you, uh, after a plausible, um, you know, strategical and tactical development, in the sense that the Catalans were pushing mostly on, on this, you know, surprise effect, ambushes, um, sometimes, however, charging also straight, which tells you that probably they were, um, you know, and coming to grips with the Turks too, so that, to say that they they weren't that heavy, um, you know, un unwieldy cavalry that would exhaust itself in pursuing them, but they were enough armored also to, to fight, uh, to charge them and to, to repeat this charge, by the way, and to eventually, eventually make them flee. Um, we are not so well informed at the point of knowing what actually happened in these battles. I mean, I presume there is a few to to, to speculate, because the areas are not um, particularly documented in the first place. We just have Montaner, who was well informed, but was making a bit of also an analogy. Uh, and uh, I I presume this is plausible, right? Also the incidents that occurred with local um, population. That brings in fact to the and the local administration altogether, as we'll see now why, because there is a bit of a romantic myth of that the fact that mm, as if successes went to the floor's head, that he began to abuse his authority and to be become openly hostile to uh, Andronicus, seeing himself as a suzerain uh, of an autonomous state to carve out in Anatolia rather than, you know, uh, having been sent there by, by imperial uh, mandate. Uh, the, 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 the question is that obviously um, the Catalans didn't give a damn <laughs> about the Byzantines and they of course were wanted to create their own state um, in Anatolia and to profit of, of the broader situation. But that was had always been the deal. I mean, in terms of realpolitik, that was uh, the, everybody's deal at at the time. Uh, the question, though, that arises is that the Byzantines pro probably didn't even expect the Catalans to have this huge success, and what the Catalans were reconquering were objectively also Byzantine communities, because, let's be honest, I mean, even under Turkish mm, rule, these were still I mean, essentially Greeks living in, in there, um, and and w m m the floor actually put to death a lot of these, um, you know, the local administrators, uh, rulers, etc. Who, you know, he accused of having actually opened gates to the Turks back in the day, um, and. Uh, the Catalans from from their own side would naturally loot and pillage all around. Were great violences, abuses, 
that's how they they survived even because these weren't I mean yes they, they weren't particularly poor areas but at the same time as we've seen they were a bit left on their own so there wasn't like an effective central government from which to draw tax it was all about looting and foraging all around um, and um, and ex exploiting the local the local communities um, so this would create a lot of jealousies and contrasts between the Catalans and the Byzantine officials that were sent to essentially to, to check their their work and to eventually ask to to return those communities to uh, to the direct imperial rule and that's how things began to happen there, were, there was all considered that the Catalan army at this point included aside from the aforementioned organic uh, as they had left Sicily um, also Byzantine troops mm -hmm. that are referred to in, also in these battles as actual uh, units of the Catalan company so-called Alans, let's say, broadly speaking, all these Pontic uh, mercenaries coming from everywhere in, I don't know, the Ukraine, the Caucasus, the, even Bulgaria, the, 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 we know there were Bulgarians in the army, uh, and so on. So it was very composite, as we've seen. There were even Turks, especially in the later, in, in, the, in the latter phase, as we will see when the Byzantines aggressed the St. Catalans. And especially the uh, so-called Alans had frictions with, with Roger, and they uh, at some point seized um, while the the company was on campaign some logistical centers so much um, this was in the Magnesia if I'm not wrong um, and uh, these were all bit ancient areas famous also for a reason I don't know Ephesus maybe seen Cizicos, et etc um, and they mm, so much that the Catalans besieged the city but they couldn't basically uh, make it and the Byzantines favored their retreat by essentially making them come back to Europe um, because of uh, the excuse was a Bulgarian invasion but it seems that that was invented but you know they were still however troubled times um, in fact initially the Byzantines had also requested the C uh, Roger now we had acquired the rank of Caesar to reduce the number of East troops to 3,000. Um, incidents had continued. So at this point, uh, the new the new Byzantine ruler was Michael the Ninth. It was under Nicholas' son and Brisley co-emperor, um, and he re uh, resolved himself to have the floor assassinated uh, in uh, 1305 at Adrianople. The, were, the Catalans were invited to a banquet, and there was a carnage. Um, from which 30, uh, 2300 of them were killed. At this point, the Catalans started being persecuted all over the empire, weren't hunted down and massacred. Uh, Montaner, on this occasion, records that uh, their, their numbers was reduced to 3300 men and 200 horses. I don't know he, whether he means actual cavalry but whatever and um, this is an important blow because the company had remained without leader was demoralized therefore the majority of the survivors disbanded but some nuclei remained intact and lived on with their with their advantage because consider this in this situation it was any kind of violence for from all sides it were private magnates even in in, in in Greece and in, even in say, the Byzantine held territory that would you know fight against I mean private wars it, it, it's a freaking mess right and uh, we know that 1500 Catalans that were actually a mixture between Almogavares and Frenchmen that um, were especially the latter together with Catalan knights were undoubtedly providing the cavalry element because the French were most likely but could also not be depends. I should check the sources honestly because the France, broadly speaking, was also somewhat varied. There were, there were uh, important infantry similar to the Catalans one, uh, the Catalan ones also in Occitania, um, southern France. I mean, um, and this army actually stormed Gallipoli on the Dardanelles. Yes, the same one of World War the First, 
um, and entrenched themselves in there, forming effectively a Catalan uh, stronghold from which they kept looting around. Um, in fact, they successfully repulsed two Byzantine attacks. This base was gradually reinforced by motley bands of adventurers, so the, they were coming literally from everywhere, plus uh, some 3,800 Turkopoles and Turks. We're talking about um, 8, 1,800 cavalry and 2,000 infantry in the case of the latter that had deserted from the Byzantines. This is interesting because in the video we made on the Turkopoles, we all observed how by this point the term doesn't mean anything more than just the, the, the tactical specialization of horse archery or even in there also heavier cavalry. I mean, it was always like that, a nucleus of heavier cavalry and lots of horse archers. Um, and, and no ethnic connotation because it was plenty of Greeks uh, this time that would simply go fight uh, in the east as Turkopoles because of the fame that the name had acquired. Uh, there were also lots of Franks, like in Cyprus, etc., were namely Turkopoles. Um, they, some of them were issued actually by the Lusignan to fight as heavy cavalry, as we were seeing now. Um, and it was plenty of same Turks in the same Byzantine army. So, th and the Turks here do not stand just because of a specific national tactics, but you know, horse archery was pre present all over the Balkans, Anatolia, uh, the North Atlantic area. So, it was a bit the standard in this uh, reality that being so politically uh, fragmented and unstable, because Greece was turned into a, a, ma a mass of various uh, states, um, they would always find their way from from the Danube, from so to to raid, to pillage, to uh, the, the Bulgarians, you know. Uh, act Traditionally, also fought with important horse archery. Um, so, it's. I would like to leave you with this picture of a, of a more courageous um, West in terms of political and social structures. And this East that now had been basically, you know, the Byzantine Empire had been disintegrated. Um, Islam, the Islamic areas were also all, uh, fr fragmented, um, and it was plenty of these um, se still semi-nomadic people living uh, around Black Sea and, and so on, that would transform these areas in a, just uh, a, a place to loot, right? And that's why in the first place all the Catalan Grand Company had gone fighting east, because even in the west, even just their tactics would have, you know, were would have not been so effective, we know it, right? Because in Western Europe they didn't achieve that big deal much, because in there, warfare was having, heading ever more towards heavy cavalry, massive numbers, specialized bodies of infantrymen, crossbowmen, pikemen. I mean, th there was a, you know, a much harder way of war. This was uh, was was uh, softer in terms of lighter troops, right? More mobility, more speed, living at the moment, in a sense. Um, and that's why these guys wouldn't find properly a job as you know, fixed mercenaries under somebody would, would basically tour around. Uh, that reflects the broader political and social fluidity of that world. Um, ultimately, internal dissension forced the same Catalans to abandon Gallipoli and split up again. The largest part was between eight to 9,000 men, including 3,000 Turks, marched inland into Thessaly, in 1308, and they finally headed towards the Frankish Duchy of Athens, where they were employed by the local Duke Gautier de Brienne, who first actually uh, used them against the Byzantines mm -hmm. and the Duchy of Neopatras, that we'll see in a while. From from boom, they they seized over thirty fortresses for him within six months, right? But again, same dynamic repeating. When peace was concluded, the duke wanted to get rid of them, um, and he especially didn't have any money to 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 maintain this pretty large number of troops. So he granted them initially lands, uh, but just to a small part of them, like five hundred namely 200 cavalry and 300 infantry. And, well, he dismissed the rest without pay, 
which was already uh, late by f four months. Uh, therefore, the Catalans rebelled against the same Gauthier of Bergen, and they fought and defeated and killed him at the Battle of Cephissa of 1311, a battle that is recorded chiefly for, in fact, the infantry tactics that allowed the Catalans to defeat the uh, Athenian uh, the Athenian charges, cavalry charges especially. Uh, it was um, important at the time because you know that just from a decade, European infantry had become to finally obtain autonomously, at least without the use of other cavalry, a victory in their own. I never studied in detail the Battle of Cephissus, but mm, I've studied in detail actually, uh, especially one battle involving the, the same, almost the same tactics, telling the truth, in, in the Catalans specifically. But um, so I'm not sure whether they were entirely foot on foot, but they um, surely were at severe uh, disadvantage of cavalry. And most was done by infantry, and um, this careful terrain choices which, um, that um, had brought the Catalans to wait for the Athenian charges on a marshy plain where the enemy horses were bogged down. Uh, this is a bit recurrent in, in early 14th century infantry victories. Um, and even in there, we don't have to think of Athenian cavalry being incompetent or that, you know, somebody's stupid because it loses battle. You know, most people wouldn't be able to do better, and most of the times in history, commanders do the o not even the right, but the only possible thing uh, to do. So never underestimate somebody just because he's defeated, because it doesn't make much sense. Um, and, in fact, I, I, I tell you, because I'm heavily involved <laughs> in this topic, I wrote this, it was work now, I'm finishing this month, exactly on this spirit and this topic and the ratio between cavalry and infantry, and you see that there are areas of Europe where cavalry actually increases at this point, in spite of infantry uh, victories. So, um, and areas were that were in deep contact with all these military cultures, so it's not really um, a valid criterion. There's no teleological progressive, you know, uh, evolution of... No, right? And especially by the mid-14th century, infantry would go d down again um, up to the, the following century. So um, one should... It's not much about the tactical formula, but what these troopers were about, because... At the end of the day, and we will see it better when may, we'll make more mm, in-depth in videos on the uh, the Almogavares and so on. In my opinion, I mean, this this Catalan army we weren't dramatically different from from uh, our armies we were facing. If not, maybe in composition, but I mean, the, the I mean, the essential tactics are are always the same, right? The infantry that you find, the infantry tactics you find in these uh, in these armies are fundamentally the same in the rest of Western Europe. I mean, infantry always does the same thing. Cavalry always does the same thing. There's no special magical trick for or formula or uh, combined arms tactics that makes it... It's mostly about the fact that these were veterans. They had a great, you know, motivation. So, it's always about moral forces at the end of the day. Um, yeah, they were skilled. They made considered choices, you know, Command also is crucial, so that explains how battles do overall, right? Not because they they fought more or less with a with a proportion of troops of in one another, right? It it, it it simply doesn't happen like that. We've seen it countless times and explained why this is the case. Um, and consider that uh, the you know if you look at the Duke of Athens cavalry, there were. Um, Ta sources speak of thousands of troops between 2,000 and 6,400 cavalry, uh, including at least 700 knights from all Frankish Greece, right? Which means a lot, telling the truth, because as we mm, we saw on that video we made recently on the Latin Empire army organization, um, these uh, formerly Byzantine held territories, which the, the the Franks had created their own uh, 
principalities after the Fourth Crusade uh, were substantially different from from Western Europe. You know, they, they had been feudalized in part, privatized. Already, the Byzantines had undergone the, the you know trans change with the Pronoia system, etc. But you know, all Greece could muster at this point 700 knights, heavy cavalry. It's not a lot, right? 700 knights, you find them habitually used by even kind of small... Let's be honest, it's, they're kind of even a small contingent for an average, I don't know, French or Italian army, right? So, it, it, of even single city-states, for example, there could be tens of that. Uh, so... Actually, it's not a great number of heavy knights at all. And it's not so surprising. And I'm just talking about numbers, and we have to study the battle in detail. But, you know, this enormous uh, threat, given that the, the Catalans also had faced uh, often in Turkey, at least according to Montaner and other sources, uh, much larger amounts of horse archers that were probably, or lighter cavalry in general, compared to knights. What the rest of these... Athenian uh, mounted troops were right. Um, so this is very important to to keep in mind because otherwise one creates certain myths that do not render justice to the actual military logic or, and capacities of the time. With all due respect to to the Catalans at Cephisus that objectively achieved a pretty impressive feat, right? It was a, an astonishing victory, but. There's also a reason why it was like it. that. That's what I'm I'm, I'm talking about. So um, after this, um, the Catalans, after Cephisus, the Catalans included 3,500 cavalry themselves and 40, uh, 4,000 infantry. Mm -hmm. So you see, even they 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 were used to fight with consistent numbers of cavalry all the way through this period. Um, the infantry was largely made up of the Almogavars. Including also, however, s some Byzantine prisoners of war that were mm, pressed into service because they they had good archery skills. This is also important to to realize because in Byzantine warfare, that had become from quite a long, you know, talking about centuries and centuries, an important aspect of of infantry training, archery. Right, and that's what you do if you, if you are an empire which is constantly surrounded by semi-nomadic peoples that come at avalanches against you, and you have to necessarily either hire them or learning how to fight like them or simply both. Um, so this is practically the the picture. The the Battle of Cephisus, but uh, I didn't say, but it was also a, a, a bloodbath. Right, um, it, it's sad. With, with some excess, that just four or five noble men of the Frankish army uh, managed to escape with their lives from from the, the disaster. While of the four to twenty-four thousand Frankish infantry, from the sources vary wildly. Right, uh, Montaner claims that twenty thousand were killed. Na naturally, he's the one talking about that. That's kind of the Montaner is not new to these things. Like he, he does it even, for example, at the Battle of Lucasisterna um, against the peasants, um, where there were, uh, in fact, Almugavaris employed by the Aragonese on that occasion. So it's a bit excessive. That there is one thing I like of Montaner specifically is that he is he's a chivalrous minded attitude, a bit like all the Aragonese chroniclers that are, you know, he's, he comes from the lower state, but even, you know, the official sources are a bit obsessed with chivalric feats, and they're, they're a bit fictional, fantasy, scientific in the way they describe certain encounters. Um, but he, in this sense, renders justice to the enemies, right? He, he you know, if they fought well, he appreciates them, he said they fought well, he praises them in a sense, but, you know, these numbers, as also the one of the Turkish campaign, are excessive, right? I, one doesn't believe them, if anything, because these people are too many, and also the losses are too high. Um, it doesn't work like that, right? So we're talking about much more contained numbers, uh, both in absolute terms and the relative ones of, of, of the killed. But still, that tells you how effective 
at the end of the day, the, these troops were in that context in a way or in another. Th this is sure, at least the opinion I formed myself reading this stuff is that, yes, th th that they actually achieved this, these results all in a row, even if their story is told um, exactly to, to praise them in, in that side. Um, that was like a bit the end, however, of the Catalan company. Um, thereafter, the Duchy of Athens itself became a Catalan state, which lasted down to 1379, which, uh, when it was taken over actually by the Navarre race, so we're talking about, after all, uh, Catalan neighbors, and uh, the Achaiuoli uh, family that was ruling Corinth, uh, that eventually would hold uh, the Duchy of uh, Neopatras up to up to the Ottoman conquest, fundamentally. So, this is a bit the introduction to the to the story, right? And as I was saying before, we will talk about this more. I plan to make at least other three or four videos about the Catalan Grand Company because it deserves attention. And especially it uh, allows that comparison that it, it's not always to be found so easily in military history of the you know of an army fighting against multiple opponents right and having enough um, you know surrounding information to to make broader comparisons and uh, analogies as we we have done today observing the fact that for example in other theaters the catalans were properly expelled because they they said the florentines for example after battle of um, of uh, of alto Pasha in 1325 sent to the um 